Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Mark 12, verses 28 to 34, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Mark. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. These verses contain a conversation between our Lord Jesus Christ and one of the scribes. For the third time in one day, we see our Lord tried by a hard question. Having put to silence the Pharisees and Sadducees, he is asked to decide a point on which much difference of opinion prevailed among the Jews, which is the first commandment of all. We have reason to bless God, that so many hard questions were propounded to our Lord. Without them, the marvelous words of wisdom which his three answers contain might never have been spoken at all. Here, as in many other cases, we see how God can bring good out of evil. He can make the most malicious assaults of his enemies work around to the good of his church and resound to his own praise. He can make the enmity of Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes minister instruction to his people. Little did the three questionnaires in this chapter think what benefit their crafty questions would confer to all Christendom. Out of the eater came forth meat. Judges 14.14 Let us observe in these verses how high is our Lord Jesus Christ's standard of duty to God and man. The question that the scribe propounded was a very wide one, which is the first commandment of all. The answer he received was probably very unlike what he expected. At any rate, if he had thought that our Lord would commend to him the observance of some outward form or ceremony, he was mistaken. He hears these solemn words, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment and the second is like it, namely this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. How striking is our Lord's description of the feeling with which we ought to regard both God and our neighbor. We are not merely to obey the one or to abstain from injuring the other. In both cases, we are to give far more than this. We are to give love, the strongest of all affections and the most comprehensive. A rule like this includes everything. It makes all petty details unnecessary. Nothing will be intentionally lacking where there is love. How striking, again, is our Lord's description of the measure in which we should love God and our neighbor. We are to love God better than ourselves with all the powers of our inward man. We cannot love him too well. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves and to deal with him in all respects as we would like him to deal with us. The marvelous wisdom of this distinction is clear and plain. We may easily err in our affections toward others, either by thinking too little or too much of them. We therefore need the rule to love them as ourselves, neither more nor less. We cannot err in our affection toward God in the matter of excess. He is worthy of all we can give him. We are therefore to love him with all our heart. Let us keep these two grand rules continually before our minds and use them daily in our journey through life. Let us see in them a summary of all that we ought to aim at in our practice, both as regards to God and man. By them, let us try every difficulty of conscience 
that may happen to beset us as to right and wrong. Happy is that man who strives to frame his life according to these rules. Let us learn from this brief exposition of the true standard of duty how great is the need in which we all naturally stand of the atonement and mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where are the men and women who can say with truth that they have perfectly loved God and perfectly loved man? Where is the person on earth who must not plead guilty when tried by such a law as this? No wonder that the scripture says, There is none righteous, no, not one. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Romans 3.10 and 20 It is only gross ignorance of the requirements of God's law which makes people undervalue the gospel. The man who has the clearest view of the moral law will always be the man who has the highest sense of the value of Christ's atoning blood. Let us observe for another thing in these verses how far a man may go in religion and yet not be a true disciple of Christ. The scribe in the passage now before us was evidently a man of more knowledge than most of his equals. He saw things which many scribes and Pharisees never saw at all. His own words are a strong proof of this. There is one God, and there is none other, but he, and to love him with all the heart, and with all understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. These words are remarkable in themselves, and doubtly remarkable when we remember who the speaker was, and the generation among whom he lived. No wonder that we read next that our Lord said, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But we must not shut our eyes to the fact that we are nowhere told that this man became one of our Lord's disciples. On this point, there is mournful silence. The parallel passage in Matthew throws not a gleam of light on this case. The other parts of the New Testament tell us nothing about him. We are left to draw the painful conclusion that, like the rich young man, he could not make up his mind to give up all and to follow Christ. Or that, like the chief rulers elsewhere mentioned, he loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. John 12:43. In short, though not far from the kingdom of God, he probably never entered into it and died outside. Cases like that of the scribe are unhappily far from being uncommon. There are thousands on every side who, like him, see much and know much of religious truth and yet live and die undecided. There are few things which are so much overlooked as the length to which people may go in religious attainments and yet never be converted and never saved. May we all mark well this man's case and take heed. Let us beware of resting our hopes of salvation on mere intellectual knowledge. We live in days where there is great danger of doing so. Education makes children acquainted with many things in religion, of which their parents were once utterly ignorant but education alone will never make a Christian in the sight of God. We must not only know the leading doctrines of the gospel with our heads, but receive them into our hearts and be guided by them in our lives. May we never rest until we are inside the kingdom of God, until we have truly repented, really believed, and have been made new creatures in Christ Jesus. If we rest satisfied in being not far from the kingdom, we shall find at last that we are shut out forevermore. That is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we have just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, If you have been a Christian for any length of time, you have undoubtedly heard this call of love for God and neighbor. Do we read it and find encouragement, or does it humble us and make us more thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is this the standard we set in all we do? And second, what does this reality of being not far from the kingdom do to our hearts? Does it challenge our comfort? Does it produce a searching to make sure we are in the kingdom? Does our intellectual knowledge stay there, or does it affect our hearts?